Madam Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, Elisha Kernut, at five foot six, was one of the smallest soldiers on the dock that day in Vicksburg. His dark hair and his black eyes complemented his wiry body that had been made almost skeletal by eight months in a Confederate prison. His friend next to him, Henry Gamble, didn't look much healthier, but they were both happy. They were standing on the dock waiting to board the ship home. They were headed back to Kentucky. During his time in the prison, Elisha had a lot of time to think. Most of the time he thought about home. He dreamed being home to give his mom a hug and his pa and his 16 siblings. But most of all, he dreamed of Ma's cooking. Had it really been just two years since he joined the army? Elisha and his friend Henry joined the Kentucky, the 14th Kentucky Volunteer Infantry two years before. And for the first year of their service, they were assigned to battles and duties in Kentucky. In April 1864, the 14th Kentucky was assigned to General Sherman's Atlanta campaign. Starting in the spring of 64 and going five months, the 14th Kentucky fought in dozens of skirmishes and major battles, all leading to Sherman's encircling siege of Atlanta. On August 8, 1864, Elisha was with the 14th, and they were entrenched at the south end of Atlanta, facing the enemy. And Elisha was captured. He was captured by the Confederates, along with his friend Henry just a few days later. They were sent to Andersonville Prison. How many of you have heard of Andersonville? Now, neither the North or the South had a great history with treatment of prisoners. But Andersonville had a reputation as being the most notorious, the most deadly, and the most vile prison camp in the country. At one time, 32,000 federal troops were imprisoned there. There was very little food, no sanitation, no medical supplies. And during the course of about a year, 12,000 prisoners died. About eight months after Elisha and Henry were captured, they got news. Robert E. Lee had just surrendered to Grant at Appomattox. Effectively, the war was over. And Elisha and Henry, <laughs> they survived. They were very happy about that. And over the next several weeks, the Confederates made arrangements to do the prisoner exchanges. They were sent by rail 400 miles to Vicksburg, Mississippi. There they had passage up the river to the Ohio and over into eastern Kentucky. It took a while sitting around in Vicksburg. As with any army anywhere, there was a lot of paperwork. But they didn't mind. For the first time in months, Elisha and Henry had good food. They had clean clothes. And even best of all, they saw the stars and stripes flying. They could wait. A few days later, everything was taken care of. The red tape was handled. And a crowd of soldiers, mostly prisoners who had been paroled, came to the docks. They saw their ship. It was the Sultana. Would you start those pictures around? The Sultana was a steamboat, 260 feet long, designed to hold 375 passengers. That day, the authorities had arranged for passage, and they put 2,300 soldiers on that ship. Imagine the crowding. Imagine the smell. Imagine the discomfort. But you know what? These soldiers, they've been through hell and back 
in battles. Most of them had been in the prisons. They knew it would be crowded, but they could handle a little bit of crowding for a few more days. Just get us home. That picture shows how crowded it was. But what it doesn't show is the boiler that had a leak the day before and was hastily repaired. That ship was strong and could handle the load, but it couldn't handle the weight distribution and it couldn't handle a leaky boiler. The ship headed out, headed north to Memphis, their first stop. Made it with okay two days later. They stopped and refueled in Memphis, and then about one in the morning headed north again on the Mississippi. Being late at night, the soldiers were all asleep, and every square foot of the Sultana was draped in sleeping soldiers. About two in the morning, everyone was shocked awake by a tremendous explosion. The boilers had gone up. Many men were killed by the initial blast. Some were killed by the steam clouds that came out of the boilers. Everyone who survived that had to deal with fire on deck because the coal furnaces had been broken open and now you had hot embers all over a wooden ship. These men had just entered a battle that very few would survive. The river was running hot and, and high. The cold spring runoffs made the water frigid and even the strongest swimmers struggled to make it to shore. Ultimately, a few hundred did. They made it to shore and they were rescued. But reports say that as many as 1,800 men perished that night. It was a terrible time. It was the single largest maritime disaster in U.S. history, even today. How many of you have ever heard of the Sultana? I'm not surprised. The news didn't really go out. There's a reason for that. The country was reeling from the recent assassination of Abraham Lincoln just two weeks before. The authorities and the newspaper editors decided the American people could not handle more bad news. And the story was suppressed. What about Elisha and Henry? Well, Henry Gamble, in his memoirs, years later wrote about his harrowing escape. He was badly injured, but he survived. He also reported that his comrade in arms and fellow Kentuckian, Elisha Kernut, was killed instantly in the blast. His parents will never have a chance to give him those hugs because his body was never recovered. Some of you might be asking, why am I so passionate about this story? You need to know something. My mother's maiden name is Kernut. And I am Elisha's first cousin four times removed. Adam Toastmaster, that makes it personal. 